So there's huge interest around this Chinese real estate firm Evergrande, which is of course on the brink of bankruptcy. It's not just, you know, people who are tracking the financial markets who are interested in the story. There's been huge interest around the world. And the question that is topmost of everyone's mind is will Evergrande become the Chinese version of the Lehman moment? Will Evergrande and its possible collapse lead to a financial contagion around the world like what we saw in 2008 when Lehman Brothers collapsed. Everybody knows that Evergrande is the biggest real estate company in China. It is neck deep in debt. It's $300 billion of debt, a lot of which is getting matured over the next few weeks and months. So the question is, will the Chinese government step in and act as a backstop, much like the US government did, and saved Lehman and other big companies back in the fall of 2008 uh, when we had the global financial crisis. Now, to really understand what's going on with Evergrande and this real estate crisis in China, you have to go back to what's been happening since the fall of 2020. You actually have to go back uh, to what happened to Jack Ma. If you remember, same time last year, there were these stories of Jack Ma suddenly disappearing uh, because he was being purged by the Chinese Communist Party. Now, ostensibly, uh, Jack Ma had made some rather uncharitable comments about the Chinese Communist Party and about how it's not encouraging entrepreneurship in China. And then suddenly, for a period of almost three months, uh, nobody heard from Jack Ma. Uh, that was essentially the Chinese Communist Party's way of telling him that you better watch out in your public comments, particularly comments that are being made seemingly against the ruling establishment in China. Now, Jack Ma has a very interesting story. Remember, this man is the Jeff Bezos of China. He runs Alibaba, which is the Amazon equivalent, the largest uh, online shopping giant in China. He completely changed the online shopping experience in China. But remember, he had very humble beginnings. Uh, he started off actually as an English language teacher in the eastern city of Hangzhou. And from there, he grew up uh, to establish the first English call center, as it were, uh, in China. And then, of course, went on uh, to, uh, to, to launch Alibaba, which is the largest online shopping enterprise in, uh, in China. So he is really a first-generation entrepreneur. Like I said, he's the Jeff Bezos of China. But it was not just Jack Ma that the Chinese Communist Party was going after. Right after Jack Ma, they also went after Didi, which is the ride-hailing app, the taxi-hailing uh, app, which is the Chinese equivalent of Uber. They went after their founder, uh, Cheng Wei, the founder of Didi, and then subsequently also after Tencent, which is the messaging app. So a whole bunch of internet companies which had been founded in the late 90s, early 2000s, and which really were the sort of flag bearers, if you will, of the new economy in China, whether it was Alibaba, Didi, or even Tencent, uh, the Chinese government started going after these new age entrepreneurs. Now, remember, all of these guys, from Jack Ma to Cheng Wei to Ma Huateng, were all sort of poster boys for what China has managed to do over the last 20 years or so. These tech giants, they were the equivalents of, let's say, you know, the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos and the Steve Jobs of China. Uh, and a lot of young Chinese people straight out of college wanted to emulate this success story. China had created its own version of Silicon Valley. And then the Chinese government decided to go after these guys because Xi Jinping felt somewhere uh, at, uh, in the middle of last year that the uh, inequality in China was getting way too high. At one point, China had over a thousand billionaires. Not even the United States has over a thousand billionaires. So he felt that the inequality was becoming so wide that eventually it would lead to social unrest. And that is the one thing that the Chinese Communist Party is paranoid about. It's paranoid about any form of social unrest. Uh, in fact, if you look at the World Bank and IMF estimates about the Gini coefficient, China, uh, for a middle-income country, has a huge uh, Gini coefficient in terms of the inequality between the rich and the poor. Uh, it was last I checked in 2019, the last year that we have figures available for, the Gini coefficient was almost 4.6, uh, so 0.46, 
which, which is a deviation from 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is the ideal Gini coefficient. So there, there's a huge disparity in, uh, in wealth and in income in China. And therefore, to try and send out a message to these new age entrepreneurs, whether it was uh, the founders of Alibaba or Didi or, or even Tencent, uh, the Chinese government started going after them. And then that campaign itself took a life of its own. Because that campaign then went from targeting new age tech entrepreneurs uh, to targeting uh, education uh, centers. Remember, there's a huge premium on uh, English language education in China. A lot of Chinese students uh, want to graduate from school and then go to the US or to UK or other Western universities and, and, and gather an English language education. There's a huge premium on that. So these uh, coaching centers that had come up, first physically and then of course riding on the tech wave, there were a lot of online coaching centers that had come up. So there was a major crackdown against the education sector, particularly the new education sector. Then there was major crackdown against uh, the fintech services, uh, against many companies that were trading uh, in the Chinese stock market. Uh, then, of course, it went into a completely different league altogether where the Chinese Communist Party had a problem with uh, children playing video games. So they started restricting the number of hours that kids could play video games uh, in China. They brought it down to about three or four hours in a week. Uh, then, of course, there was this huge campaign against uh, Korean pop bands. Remember, uh, K-pop bands are very popular in China, just like, just like they are uh, in any other part of the world. Uh, so there was a massive crackdown against K-pop bands. Uh, there was even a document put out by the Chinese Communist Party about uh, men not displaying, overtly certainly not displaying, any effeminate uh, characters or qualities. Uh, they felt uh, that K-pop stars were being a bad influence uh, on the masculinity of the men in China. So it just went into a completely bizarre territory altogether. Uh, that continuing crackdown is going on. And like I said, it was being done at two levels. One, for the economic reason, which is to try and bridge the disparity between the rich and the poor and also this cultural disparity. It was about anything that is important, whether it is Hollywood movies, whether it is Coca-Cola, whether it is K-pop bands, were all seen as bad influence and therefore uh, this was also done in the cultural realm to try and bring up uh, Chinese culture and, and, and promote Chinese cultural symbols and icons and so on. Now that brings us to Evergrande and why you should pay attention to the possible collapse of the largest real estate firm in China. Now, Evergrande, just like many other Chinese companies, real estate companies, rode on a real estate boom. The first leg of it happened around the 2008 Beijing Olympics. There was huge infrastructure being constructed in and around Beijing. The 2010 Shanghai uh, World Expo. So in that period between, say, 2007 uh, to 2010, there was major real estate expansion in the big cities in China particularly the big two, that's Beijing and Shanghai and Evergrande, uh, was, was constructing you know, buildings after buildings and they were taking advantage of this huge real estate boom. Then after the 2008 global financial crisis, there was a huge premium from the top, from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the top echelons of the party, uh, to try and spread this real estate boom to other cities. So from 2009-10 onwards till about 2014-15, you had a huge number of these tier two cities coming up uh, in China. Uh, China at one point of time had about 700 cities. I mean, again, not even the United States has 700 cities uh, at one point of time. And many of these cities eventually turned out to be like ghost towns. You know, uh, towns like Ordos, for example, in Mongolia or Nanhui. Uh, even many would say Pudong, where uh, the, the new uh, Shanghai airport was built on the outskirts of Shanghai, even that uh, turned out to be a bit of a ghost town. So there were these you know, rows and rows of infrastructure that was built, commercial infrastructure, residential infrastructure that was built, uh, and there were no people to occupy. So the, for a brief bit, the Chinese Communist Party had this population redistribution scheme. China, much like you know, India or other countries, much of the development is focused in certain parts of the country. It's largely in the east along the coast and also some parts uh, in the south, uh, close to Hong Kong and so on. But the western part of China, which is largely Xinjiang and Tibet, there hasn't been as much development. So there's a big skew uh, if, you, if you were to look at the eastern and southern parts of China, uh, where again, all indicators, economic indicators, social indicators are all much higher uh, than the western part of China. So for, for, for a brief bit, uh, the Chinese government was redistributing its population. It was helping people relocate, as it were, to the western parts. But they realized even that is not good enough. It was still not helping 
uh, quench this real estate boom as it were. There was massive supply and very little demand to quench that. So as in, uh, in a situation like this anywhere in the world, what would happen is the speculators then, then uh, latch on. And so the property market uh, went through astronomical price rises in the 10 year period from let's say 2010 till 2020. And again, in the fall of last year, the Chinese government realized that these astronomical uh, real estate prices were detrimental uh, to the larger good of society. Again, it comes back to the fear of social unrest. One of the main things that young people, young couples, uh, you know, who start off in life in China, the first thing they want is to buy a house. And it had become absolutely unaffordable for a large majority of the population to buy a house because real estate prices were being kept artificially high by speculators, by builders, and of course, uh, by, by a section of the lenders as well. So in the fall of last year, uh, the Chinese government introduced something called the three red lines. Now these were financial criteria that were laid down for lenders uh, not to lend to real estate companies if they did not meet uh, the three financial criteria uh, that were laid down. And one of which was your debt to sales ratio. Now most of the Chinese real estate companies, their debt uh, is hugely over disproportionate to the assets that they have uh, in hand and to the sales that they are making. That's why companies like Evergrande, uh, suddenly they found their sort of funding routes completely cut off. Banks were not lending to them. Other institutions were not lending to them because they all had to meet this three red line criteria. And suddenly uh, the chickens have come home to roost because now uh, there are a whole bunch of maturities that they need to, to cater to, a whole bunch of payments that they need to make. And then suddenly, uh, in, in the last few weeks, uh, the promoters of the company, the, the stockholders of the company, woke up and realized that this company was $300 billion in debt, uh, and they simply did not have the assets uh, to, to meet those financial obligations. So now, the ball is really in the Chinese government's uh, court, as it were. The question that's being asked is, will the Chinese government, much like what we saw in the 2008 global financial crisis, whether it was in the US or in Europe, will the government of China act as the ultimate backstop? Remember, all of the speculation in real estate had a fundamental premise, and that premise was the government would not let real estate collapse because the social and economic costs if real estate were to collapse is so huge that ultimately the government would provide the ultimate backstop. The difference this time around, I think Xi Jinping is making a calculated call and, and the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party is making a calculated call that it's okay even if one or two of the big firms fail. It's in contrast to the approach taken by Obama when he was president when the 08 crisis happened. Uh, then they realized that some companies are simply too big to fail. That's how that phrase came into existence, too big to fail. Here in China though, uh, Xi Jinping seems to have taken a slightly different call. He says, even if one or two big companies were to fail, that is the only way you can bring down the speculative, artificial, sky-high real estate prices down because the Chinese government has been trying all kinds of instruments over the last 10 years to bring down, to burst this bubble. Remember, in China, all other sectors, whether it is steel or gas or any other conventional sector, now even in tech, the bubble has burst. It's only in real estate that the bubble has not burst yet. The only problem though is, what kind of contagion effect will that have? Remember, real estate uh, affects all other industries as well. It affects construction, it affects uh, steel and cement, it affects power. And interestingly, what you're also seeing as far as the power play in China is concerned, over the last few weeks or so, there is a concerted, deliberate attempt by the Chinese government to crack down on power generation. So for the first time in almost 20, 30 years, major Chinese cities are seeing massive power cuts. And it, the reason why they're seeing it is because there's been a deliberate slowdown in the generation of power. Now, the Chinese government says it's simply because uh, they want to ensure that they meet their climate change goals. And also, uh, there is a hidden reason for this. By deliberately slowing down power generation, what they're also doing is uh, inadvertently or advertently exporting inflation to the West. It's the easiest form of exporting inflation to the West. So for example now, uh, just taking the example of the iPhone, a large proportion of the iPhones are manufactured uh, in China. 
uh, many of them for Western audiences. And now you have the festive season coming up with Christmas and stuff in the West, where people are going Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, and people will be shopping for, for iPhones with the new models and so on. Uh, so the easiest way to export inflation to the West, particularly ahead of this festive season, uh, is to slow down production by cutting down on power generation and power distribution. So that is what is happening in China right now, this rebalancing act. Uh, basically, what Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party want to do uh, is to change the export-driven model of China, uh, which was its success over the last 30, 40 years. They want to change that export-driven model into a consumption-driven model. And what we are seeing over the last year, year and a half, whether it is the crackdown on the, on, on the big new age technology companies or on the education companies or now on real estate, uh, and, and also on the power generation companies, what you're seeing is this rebalancing, this big rebalancing uh, that the second biggest economy in the world is doing from an export and investment-driven model to a consumption-driven model.